Hi, everyone. Good evening and welcome to our very special event with Ben Philippe in conversation with Becky Albertalli. I'm so excited for this event and I hope you are too. My name is Kim Havens and I'm the event manager here at An Unlikely Story. Before we start, I'd like to go over just a couple technical tips. If your picture is blurry, you can click on the help button up on the top right and choose compatibility mode. If you lose your connection or your video, just completely exit out of the browser and jump right back in. Ben Philippe is a New York-based writer and screenwriter born in Haiti and raised in Montreal, Canada. He has a Bachelor of Arts from Columbia University and an MFA in Fiction and Screenwriting from the Missioner Center for Writers in Austin, Texas. When he's not writing YA novels, he's a culture writer and he teaches film studies and screenwriting at Barnard College. Ben's debut novel, The Field Guide to the North American Teenager, won the William C. Morris YA Debut Award and was named a Best Teen Book of 2019 by NPR and the New York Public Library. In person, Ben is funny, charming, and brilliant, and I just could not wait to welcome him back to this event, even virtually. The last time he was here, it was during a torrential downpour and Boston was flooded, including everywhere around the airport. Every attendee waited over an hour for the authors to arrive and it was well worth the wait. His new novel, Charming as a Verb, just came out yesterday and you're going to love it. Here it is. Henry, halty halty wangers, got his game on, charming New York City's elite while he walks their dogs, raising funds for a Columbia education. But Corrine, his intense classmate and neighbor, uncovers his less than honest dog walking scheme and blackmails him into helping her change her image at school. So I'm not gonna go much more into it because I know Becky and Ben are gonna talk it, talk a lot about it. Um, I just wanna let you know, Halsey and Corrine's banter will leave you laughing out loud and rooting for their will they, won't they romance. Joining Ben is Becky Albertalli, the number one New York Times bestselling author of William C. Morris Award winner and National Book Award long list title, Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda. It's now a major motion picture, Love, Simon. She's also the author of the acclaimed The Upside of Unrequited and What If It's Us, called written with Adam Silvera. She's joining us today from Atlanta, where she lives with her family. So now it is my distinct honor to welcome Ben Philippe and Becky Albertalli. Hello. Welcome. Hi, Hi Becky. <laughs> Thank you so much for letting me do this with you. I, um, I'm beyond honored and um, I have a lot of things that I want to know about. But first, I just I need like a minute to just talk your face off about how much I freaking love this book. Um, and I say this, I say this as a, you know, an obvious big fan of your debut. So my expectations were through the roof um, and you shot through them like like Willy Wonka, you know, like like the elevator, you know, that was you uh, with this book. Um, yeah, I, um, I shipped it. I just like, I was sitting there cackling to myself and like making my children look at me strangely. And, and um, you know, it's hard to, explain the, like the magic and humor of a perfectly executed YA book to you know an eight-year-old and a six-year-old but like I tried um yeah there are um there are certain things that we're gonna have to talk about afterwards because I'm committed to no spoilers for this but um yeah just you knocked it out of the park um I I want to start by asking you also about the title because it is possibly my very favorite title of any book ever. That Where did it come from? Nice. Um, <laughs> all of that was super nice. Just the introduction, <laughs> validation for your sophomore book, which is funny, very stressful. Um, where did the title come from? It's actually taken from inside the book. At some point, uh, someone is speaking about Henry, uh, about how Henry was when he was a baby. and. They say, you know, most kids are charming as an adjective, but you are always char charming as a verb. And when we were trying to think of titles for the book, I'm really bad at titles. I think the field guide to the North American teenager kind of proves that. <laughs> um, but this was like I a little- I love your titles. I, yeah, no, I'm not so bad at titles. Oh, I, I always feel like 
I don't quite land it with yeah. titles. I know so many authors are like, I had this title and I didn't have a book for it. I'm always the opposite. Um, but it felt like it summarized Henry pretty well. Like someone who's not malicious about it, but for whom charming is an active action that they undertake every day. He, yeah, he really is too. Like he's, um, you know, and not just, um, you know, like, you know, it, it's not just that he's extroverted or that he, um, you know, is um, a player or anything like that. He's just, like he just radiates um charm and charisma and, and it's um bizarre that you were able to pull it off so brilliantly in a book that is like literal like black type on white paper um you did that <laughs> so thank you um <laughs> so i um so you mentioned this is uh your sophomore book and um I, so I know a little something about second book syndrome and I read, having read kind of your um, acknowledgements and the little author's note that was contained in there, it sounded like you, um, you know, had um, a little bit of second book syndrome while writing this. What was the process like compared to Field Guide? Oh, it, it sucked. Can I say that? I'm not allowed to say that because my name is like, <laughs> you can say it. <laughs> yeah. and we get to do this yeah. and people read it and all that is so fun but uh for the second book uh i don't know why i had the story clearly in my head and you just assume that if you write it if it's you know on the screen if you have eighty thousand words that are really sort of like the story you had the premise you had in your head then you've captured it you've written the book and it just wasn't it was still henry it was still corinne it, he was still a dog walker in new york city they lived in the same building so a lot of things were kind of similar um, or exactly the same, but the execution was just off. And I think maybe one thing I've realized is that I need to really like my characters to like be able to spend time with them and just like be happy with the book. Um, I really like Norris from my first book. He's asocial, he's snarky, he's borderline feral socially, which I totally respond to, but I adored that kid. <laughs> um, this first version, this prototype of Henry was kind of the same, but he had a real chip on his shoulder. And he was sort of very aware that he was like poorer than the other kids at his school. He was very aware that he was poorer than uh, Corinne. So when he's hired to be a dog walker, a lot of their dynamic was that she's wealthy and he's not, and he hates that and he's resentful. And even Corinne was defined by her wealth. And ultimately I realized after the book was written, it would have been nice to realize it before the book was written or while the book was being written. But <laughs> I just realized that, oh, all their personalities are about, you know, their income or their family's incomes. And that just felt off. So when I started it again, um, my editor sort of like, I sent the full draft and they were like, oh, oh, this is good. We should talk. And then that call, and you know it's going to be bad if it's a call, came like a few yeah weeks later and they're like yeah we just think there's some work that needs to be done there and i was like you think it's bad right and there was a long pause and they're like yeah and it was just such a relief for me because I, I knew it all along <laughs> so i was able to like okay i think I can... alessandra like... <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I mean she knows she i mean she knows me so well uh, at this point um, oh. and the fact that, like, I was able to like toss something I had worked on for like nine, ten months and just start over again means that she was right, everyone involved was right, and it didn't really emotionally drain me. Like, I think it, it was if I was really proud of the first version, uh, I would have been like, well, I'm gonna go to bed for three weeks. Um, all of you can go to hell. And but <laughs> it was like, oh no, no, you're totally right. And I was able to start anew and really like let myself be charmed by Henry. Like Henry, even this version of Henry kind of has a chip on his shoulder about the fact that he's not from a wealthy family. His dad is a janitor. Um, but he sort of like weaponized that or just like used it as like an armor of charm. Um, so he keeps things really superficial with everyone. Um, he's the guy that turns the conversation about the other person right away because he doesn't really want to talk about himself. And that switch was at the heart of Henry. So that, it's a long way of saying that um, the first draft kicked my butt, but I was able to sort of like get 
deeper focus and insight into this, hopefully, correct version of the story. I find that really fascinating because you can see kind of, you know, which, you know, because all the things you were saying kind of about um, particularly Henry's relationship to, um, you know, money, his family's financial situation compared to other students in his school and stuff like it's such a huge, important part of the book, and it's and you uh, play with it so differently in the final version than what you just um, described. And I found it really like um, it was unbelievably moving to kind of get deeper and deeper into his head about that. Where um, you know you kind of um, you know in, in the beginning, it's not quite as overt that he is self-conscious about it but you kind of see these little cracks like his best friend has never seen his you know the inside of his apartment and for a while didn't even know like kind of where it was um he's like you know he's just like creating that distance um but in this kind of sunshiny way um and then when like the shit hit the uh poop it's the fan <laughs> you know yeah you know you see it like it's almost as if um maybe um kind of you know the chip on the shoulder that you describe like it's still there and that's that's where you can really see it um and um he and he makes some good points it's it's like you know it is uh not a bad chip <laughs> you know he's um, yeah, just, like, I, I can't wait for people to read it. Like, he, he just says some really important things about, um, just the way systems are, are designed to benefit some people and not others. Um, and okay, also, I'm going to move because I don't, I don't want to, like, spoil anything, but oh, wait, jump in, jump in. Yeah. Oh, no, I was just going to add that, uh, also, he's the, ch he's the child of immigrants. And that is something that was maybe sort of borrowed from my life in that when your parents are like first generation immigrants, you always feel like there's only so much you can complain about, right? Henry lives in New York City. He goes to this amazing magnet school because he won a scholarship and he doesn't have money, but that's not because his parents have all this wealth that they're hiding from him is that they just don't have any money. So even when I was younger, like you can't be like, why are we poor? Why don't we have money? Like. That's a very uh, <laughs> and self uh, selfish way of see seeing the world. So it's a type of frustration that you can't really vent at anyone. You can vent it at our capitalism, but it's not your parents and they're trying their best. And I think Henry, when he comes home and he's had a rough day being surrounded by, you know, the children of millionaires of Manhattan, he also sees that his dad has been a janitor sort of cleaning floors for people. His mom used to be a, a nurse sort of like cleaning vomit in hospital. So he has to like smile through all of it. And that's part of the character's relationship to money. Yeah, well, and, and kind of, you know, thinking about him being um, a child of immigrants and, um, you know, and you've actually set up this full family history that is just kind of beyond his immediate family situation. Um, you know, and um, so I'm curious, like, do you have um, a sense of how Henry's worldview is affected, not just by um, what you just mentioned, kind of thinking about, um, you know, his parents and, and kind of what you know, kind of how they are spending their days and, and um, kind of, you know, how much money they are able to bring in, but even um, kind of going back a couple of generations, um, you kind of describe each generation kind of like um, taking kind of a jump in one particular direction and that being kind of a huge driving force for Henry. Um, yeah, I think, oh, this is where it all begins to feel like therapy. It always begins <laughs> to feel like therapy. Um, but his parents sort of like <laughs> come from Haiti to the United States to North America because they wanted to give him a better life. 
And I think Henry sort of always has to compare his struggles to their past struggles so that he tends to minimize his own struggles. So the dream to go to Colombia, which is like his big driving force, it comes partly from parental expectations, but I always feel like the stuff that your parents really want for you, um, either you're gonna fight it your entire life or at some point you internalize it. In Henry's case, he's like, yeah, I'm going to Colombia. And that's always been like the plan. That's been the family plan. So for him not to follow that tradition that started like an ocean away back in Haiti with his sort of like, in my mind, his family history might be kind of like parallel to mine, grandparents in like little villages, um, parents in the cities, and then parents sort of like getting foreign educations and then parents immigrating. Like he he's like the latest in a tradition of people who are moving up in the world. So even like expressing a desire to do something else, to pursue the arts or something would be deviating from a plan that's not just his or his parents, but that's been like a lifetime in the making. So that's why he doesn't really do much of that until he kind of does. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and it's so, well, it's interesting because when you think about, um, like, you know, I, like, so I've written characters um, who, you know, have been very focused on a particular school, you know, and then every once in a while you will get some exasperated re reviewer being like, um, like, this kid needs to get out of their head, like, there's more than one school, how can these YA characters not see that? And here with Henry, I think, like you feel the full weight of these like generations of like expectations and just like what he feels is expected of him it to me it just completely subverted you know to the extent that that's a trope that's overdone which obviously i don't think it is because i'm constantly doing it but um, maybe i personally am the reason that it's overdone but like i just the way you subverted that by like just the minute you could imagine a reader being like you know like chill on columbia all of a sudden it's like <laughs> oh you know like you just get you get like you know for me there's just this moment in the text where it's just like i get it like you know I yeah and there's, the i mean i always feel like we as adults grown-ups because we belong to the tribe of grown-ups now we really don't talk well to younger generations or younger people about college because uh, you know even with like the infamous like uh college admission scandal where it was the parents who were falsifying documents and bribing to get their kids into the schools the narrative there was sort of like oh the kids don't really want it and the parents want it and there's more than one college out there and it's so small-minded um and that is true but even I know that when you are talking to like 17 year old Ben, 18 year old Ben, there's nothing I wanted more than to get like into my one dream college. Like we, it, the entire system is set up. Like mm -hmm. pop culture that portrays college as like this, you know, stepping stone of American life. Like it's like, oh, parties, like all nighters. And then you get the fancy jobs. Like college is anchored in the American experience. And then we have schools that say the same thing. And then we have rankings, like the Princeton Review is going to say, well, your college is the fourth in the world now. And it's so much pressure that's internalizing to kids. So even if I, at 31, was talking to like 17-year-old Ben and saying like, it's okay if you don't get into Yale, Stanford, or Columbia. Like, it's like, there are so many more colleges. <laughs> it's a small pool. I would just like ignore it completely and keep moving forward because, uh, I had to find the entire world into those schools. And I honestly, I don't think I've wanted something as badly as an acceptance letter into one of those schools, even like selling my first book or getting my first grown up job, all the stuff that have really like shaped my life, arguably maybe more than like the college I went to. Um, none of them have been like this imagined state that I was thinking about every single day. like. Mm -hmm. I think I'm on Twitter too much now, but I was refreshing that admissions portal all day, every day for three months. I was on like college, ooh, college confidential. There's a, there's a message board where you can go and you compare your stats with other kids all <laughs> over. 
and like, oh God, I got a 2320 on my SATs, life is over. Um, so I think I wanted to write Henry in that hyper pressure, chamber of pressure um, to hopefully address it. And by the end of the book, let some air out of that room without like dismissing it entirely. Because, you know, looking back, not that pressure if there are any young people listening to this, but <laughs> the these were probably the most important test I've ever taken in my life. Um, that's how I was able to get like financial aid to afford college. Um, and it irrevocably, that's where I, le I learned to write. Like I didn't start to write when I was 14. I started to write when I was 19 and taking a creative writing workshop just for fun. Um, so it did define my life in every way, but I also know that I wanted it too badly. It was unhealthy. Yeah, well, and it's also really interesting when you think about, like you mentioned, the competition and kind of the way students will, um, you know, it, it is not just, I want this thing for myself, or I imagine kind of myself living this life next year. Um, it is also like, how do I measure up against my peers? And um, in Henry's case, you know, one of the things that I think just is so important and brilliant that you did with this book was that you um he's very aware of um you know he's he's very aware of kind of where he stands like academically kind of which schools like he would have a good shot of getting into which ones he wouldn't um and he's also aware of kind of some of the advantages you know there are a lot of kids in henry's class who are um playing a very different ball game and he is um like um I'd, I'd love to hear more about uh marvin he i he like i wanted to punch him uh he is an amazing character i like i'd love to hear um Thank you. Oh. Where, where, Hell, he came from. Like, I love this question because I <laughs> Henry and Corinne a lot and their families, and I'm happy to do that. But Marvin was one of those side characters. Um, oh, I'm saving Corinne. Yeah. Well, so you'll be, yeah. I will be asking you about Corinne. Yeah. Well, I will I rant on and on about Corinne. She might be my favorite in the book. But Marvin is like one of the smaller characters that I still very much enjoyed writing. Um, and <laughs> I'm happy to talk about. Uh, He's kind of like this, from the outset, he's kind of like the smarmy frenemy to Henry. Um, <laughs> and they're both like popular and they don't like each other, but there's no sort of like, oh, I hate this guy, I hate this guy. So they have to sort of like trade fist bumps, pretend to be bros, but like they really don't. <laughs> and I don't even know if I define, oh, this is a bad thing for the writer to admit. I changed his ethnicity a few times um, in the book. Because in my mind, if he was also black like Henry, that was a different thing than if he was white. I think if he was white, um, that simplified it in a way that made him like oh, too easily, uh, he's the rich white guy. So I think he's like ambiguously ethnic now. I, um, I know there are mentions of it um, and I'm forgetting where it landed because I changed it so much. Um, but the idea is that just like Henry, Marvin is very aware of the system. Henry is aware that the system isn't fair and that he doesn't have a lot of advantages. And Marvin is just aware that the system isn't fair and that he has a lot of advantages. So for him, his dream school is also Columbia, but he's less worried because he's like a third generation legacy. Um, he He's very smart. I kind of wanted to just work off the default that all those kids are smart. Because I do think like what college is kind of a trope in YA and in youth-based acts entertainment. Like everybody wants to nail the SATs to get into a good college and they're like, oh, if I fail this class, I won't get into college. The real system is so much more complicated than that. You need to have a 4.0 GPA recommendation letters. You need to sort of interviewed, which is wild to me. Um, you need <laughs> to have extracurricular activities and you need to sort of assemble the right profile that's gonna read well from the perspective of an adult that has like 200 to go through before lunch. And it's so much pressure to put on, on kids. So I think those kids who are competitive are also very self-aware. And Marvin is just self-aware of his privilege. And um, 
that could make him the villain, but I think he's more like a representation of the world. And in a way, I kind of wanted the kids to know more about this stuff than the adults. Like even Henry's family, his dad just assumes that you go to a magnet school, you get good grades, you're getting into Columbia. It's as simple as that. Like just go to, do your homework. Did you do your homework? If you did your homework, you're getting into the fancy college. <laughs> so not what it is because I know people who've gotten 4.0s. I know Worry Gilmore types kids who are like, I have everything and I didn't get in. And I think in your head, um, you start to imagine there's a better version of you out there. Someone that is just like you, but a little better, a little more charming, a little more like has more likable. So their recommendation letters were better. So you start to imagine like a shadow version of yourself almost. And in Henry's case, that shadow version is, is, is basically Marvin. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, you are so much better than Marvin. <laughs> <laughs> and I, um, oh, sorry, that would be spoiling, but I don't hate Marvin. I don't think Marvin is. Uh, I, 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 I know they exist, and that teenagers can be very, very mean and very sort of like selfish and self-absorbed. I, I don't. I've never met an evil teenager in my life. I've met bullies. I've met sort of people who are just like doused in privilege i've never met a villain um and i think marvin we only get henry's perspective on marvin um so there's <laughs> um i have my sympathies for marvin too there are a couple of lines that are there to show that maybe marvin's family life is very different from henry's and that you know when you accomplish that's just a given that's what you we were supposed to do and we, we don't need to talk more about it so hopefully that comes through love marvin yeah, I just like, I feel like we could do a whole conversation on every single one of these kind of just core group of characters. The characters are so vivid. I, um, I do have to talk about my girl, Corinne, <laughs> who I love with every fiber of my being. Like, I would die for her. <laughs> she is biggest nerd I've ever met in a book <laughs> like she is like like that like she is the definition of, she's like big dork energy or something like she's like flash card energy she's like um an absolute like I, I I like you know one of the things that I love about um your characters this is I mean this is just true of both of your books so much is 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 that there's not like you know, there's this whole world of characters who are each on their own arcs. And so you really get to see Corinne change, like certain things about her um, kind of, you know, just grow along with Henry in this really interesting way. Um, is there anything you can share about that? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. I, I love Corinne yeah. too. Um, earlier you were talking about sort of like criticism that it's weird after you've written one book, and then another one, so I guess after you've written two books, like people start to have, not assumptions, but like they see tendencies in your writing. And one criticism that I've glimpsed for like the one week where I read Goodreads reviews when I have a new book out, because it's like, there are that <laughs> few. So one five star, one one right. changes the whole game. Like, did I write a two star book? No? Oh no, that was just not <laughs> we're back. Um, right. uh, <laughs> one of the things that people notice about my writing, that I notice about my writing, is that um, it feels like sometimes stuff happens in the characters' lives um, that we don't get to see. So not to spoil too much from this one, so I'll spoil something from the first one. Um, but at some point, Artie, who was one of the love interests, has this monologue about how, how she experienced the protagonist, Norris. And we didn't see scenes of her seeing him as a jock. We didn't see scenes of her sort of like having all these emotions. So for some people, it, came kind of out of the blue, which is very fair criticism. Um, but for me, that just kind of makes sense because people have lives away from you. So your experience of them is limited. So just like everyone around Henry school doesn't know what his home life is like, he doesn't know what their home lives are like. So in Corinne's case, I think she's someone who thinks a lot. She overperforms in school. 
And then she goes home and she thinks about how she performed in school. And she's kind of reached, this is said in senior, senior <laughs> year. And she's reached this point where she's like, oh, socially I've underperformed. So she starts this entire thing by like, there are two ways of reading how she's moving through the book. I'm being very incoherent, trying to talk around spoilers, but essentially part of the premise that she blackmailed Henry into helping her become more social around the school. And, you know, one reading of it is that she does it because she's pragmatic, she's headstrong, she's like, I have a problem, you're the easiest solution, help me or I will ruin your life. But the other, which is where I think I lean, is that, I mean, this is a rom-com, so spoiler alert for romance, but I think she's always had a crush on Henry. And I think that this entire convoluted, aggressively intense way of approaching him <laughs> was almost her version of the version of her going like, Hi Henry, how's your day? <laughs> like for <her laughs> how she approached this interpersonal uh uh relation. And yeah, I, I just love Corinne. I could talk about her all day. All my like when you finish writing a book, you're like, oh I should have done this different, I should have done this different. I'm pretty happy with how Henry turned out, partly because like, you know he drained a full book out of me before, but there's so much <laughs> her in. I, I, I would love to spend more time in her head, um, knowing what I know about her now that I finished the book. Uh, I just think she's, she's awesome. There's that type of, I, sometimes like narratives about children or young people in schools um, are very limited in that like, oh, you're popular or you're bullied or like you're a nobody or you're super infamous and everyone's gossiping about you. And those things are true, but there are people like, Corinne's not bullied. She's a little lonely because people stay away from her, um, but they don't stay away from her and mock her. She's just, okay, she's sitting first row. She has flashcards, she has notebooks. She's ready to like perform and be valedictorian. So people kind of stay away. And that, you know, that's a different form of loneliness too. That's a different form of like, not fitting in uh, by like hyper performing. So I think that's hopefully what I wanted to capture in her. I think you nailed it. And I think like, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because with Corinne, like I, um, I mean, she's cooler than me, but like I could, I could relate to a lot about her where it's just like, you know, there are these moments of, um, you know, insecurity or self-doubt, or she's kind of like, she's like, I am the wrong kind of person in this one way. But kind of with who she is, she she tries to like, kind of put a box around it and like, just like address it in this, um, yeah, and just in this um, very methodical way that it's just like, <laughs> You know, even as she is trying to be less intense, she is so intense in the in the way she is going about it. And like the two of them just like play off each other so adorably. <laughs> um I lost it in Montreal, and that's all I'm gonna say. Like there's like a moment in Montreal, like and yeah, I I like I'm a grown ass woman and I <laughs> squealed like I, I'm a mother, you know. I like, like um I, I wanna know is oh no, 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 this. No. and then I'll say okay. Um well just like you have such a like just like you you have that um rom com sensibility like better than just about anybody I've seen just like the beats of it, the um, like the chemistry and the, you know, just the the kind of the way it builds and kind of the payoff and everything. And I want to know, um, like, what are the rom coms that you? Um, what was your input uh, growing up? What, what did you um, absorb? Who's your OTP? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> OTP. Yeah. Oh, my OTP has to be Rory and Jess from the Gilmore Girls. Um, Frank <laughs> Gilmore out there. It's I, I love rom coms. But I don't I, I've watched the movies, but the movies like Clueless, John Hughes, like they didn't really 
I, I love movies, but they didn't really influence me in that you don't get to live inside of them the way you get to live inside TV shows. And like, I mean, we come to the school of like, no, you do not get to binge 10 episodes in a row with a click of a button. Every week you have to tune in <laughs> and hope it's not a rerun and you don't know what's going to happen. There are no spoilers or set photos and you just like tune into this world and kind of hope for the best. And I vividly remember season three of Gilmore Girls where it's like, it's the Jess season. No, I think he, he shows up <laughs> in season two. Season two and season three is a Jess. And it's like, Rory has a boyfriend, Dean, who they've been making progressively, you know, less intelligent, more of a blockhead, just to make room for <laughs> Jess, who's like this newcomer in a leather jacket, who's like, Luke's nephew. I'm sorry, if you don't watch Gilmore Girls, it's all very confusing and I apologize. Um, but if you want oh, to. I, I am right with you. I'm, <laughs> um, I'm caught up. Yeah. And I think I was just like in that space of longing <laughs> for the two of them to spend time together. Mm -hmm. I think we sort of like when we talk about rom coms and pairings, we're like, oh, these are these two characters should be together. But the space before that is like, oh, we want to see them spend time together. We just want to see them in the same room and interact. And every time Jess managed to like interact with Rory um, before the romance started. Once the romance started, he's really not a good boyfriend. It's kind of, you know, <laughs> and a little emotionally abusive. Season three ends on a sour note for Jess and Rory, but the long <laughs> was really, really fun. And I kind of wanted to capture that. I was just like, it just happened. Let's just have the two of them in a scene together and let's see what comes up. And putting them in Montreal kind of felt right for plot reasons, but also because I'm from Montreal. Um, it's a city that like I've learned to appreciate more now that I've left it. I mean, when you like you just want to go to college in New York in New York City when that's your big goal, you can't wait to say goodbye to Montreal. But now every time I go back, I'm like, wow, this is a really cool place. I I, I was lucky to be <laughs> Queen Subway speak French and English, and it's super diverse. I, I love Montreal. And I, it, that location sort of serves as a honeymoon, like, trip for them, even though they're not in a relationship. Um, uh, that was really, really fun. But I think, yeah, romance is wanting to spend time with characters. I, I have controversial opinions about Jim from The Office, but I will say oh, I that, like, I... Careful. Careful. <laughs> I, know, I know. Oh, believe me. I am a teacher. Like, people have <laughs> my opinions, which are all factual. I've interviewed uh, a New uh, York. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I interviewed um, Chris Brown from The New Yorker um, about television and its effect on society. And I said something about Jim that she really didn't like. So she spent like five minutes of the of the interview, or this very public interview, kind of dragging me. <laughs> but I'm like, I stand by it. Um, but I will say that Jim and Pam, when people talk about that, I think what we latch on to is that, that, that longing between two characters who haven't quite figured it out yet. Like, it would be so easy for you two to just go into the conference room, talk it out, and be together. But in your head, your insecurities, you're like, this is all me. This is not two-sided. And if any of it was two-sided, what if I we ruin this? Because I think, I don't know, part of the reason why I respond less enthusiastically to rom-com movies is that, like, the kiss at the end is just the beginning, right? The first thing you're assured of when uh, every breakup begins with a kiss. So the kiss at the end is always, like, this kind of sad moment for me. I can't quite latch onto it. I'm like, oh, this can go so many ways. Um, <laughs> but when you spend time with the characters, all you have is the longing. And I really like that when writing a pairing, a romantic pairing. And that's what I try to capture. Um, and hopefully I did in Corinne and Henry. I will also add, sorry, I'm, this is fully therapy. I'm using this as like therapy. Um, I will add. I'm still here. <laughs> right? fun. Oh, you're very therapist. Um, <laughs> all the best relationships in my life have been those that were friendships too. Um, mm -hmm. So that like this person can just, you can just hang out with them. You can just like spend a, a, an obscene amount of time talking about anything, doing anything. And I really wanted to establish a friendship between these two so much so that like you understand why these two characters would maybe not, especially Corinne, 
wouldn't risk adding romance to this. This is fully defined. This is what it is and it's nice. If we turn this into a romance, I am bad at that. And it's just, it might unravel everything. So I, I, I wanted to write them as friends first. Yeah, you, like, the pining is palpable. It's, um, yeah, just like, you do that so well. That's my favorite part too of rom-coms and um, yeah, and just any TV show relationship arc or anything like that is, um, yeah, the buildup and you like, I mean, you take it to the point where some, it, 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 it can be like a well-timed, like top volume song that like blasts them apart, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, excruciating in the best way for a while there it's like ugh. It, and um you know one thing to it like i think to me this like this is just this tiny little moment in the book that says so much about henry and corinne's dynamic i don't think this is much of a spoiler but i'm going to be vague about it but it's just like um you know, there is a, like, Henry does debate. Um, you know this, I know. <laughs> like, I know you're his creator, but, um, but to people watching, Henry does debate. And, um, you know, there's um, just one little quick conversation between Henry and Corinne where, um, you know, Corinne's like, you did a good job. And Henry's like, uh, the, this other person, this other group, like, did better than me. And Corinne's like, yeah, like, she's just, that's who she is. Like, he knows it. And, like, it is just, like, I don't know. And, and it, like, you can just feel him, like, appreciating that about her just because it's Corinne. It's peak Corinne. And, um, yeah, I just, like, I love them. I, um, yeah, I would read hundred books about them. So. Thank you so much. I I mean, I think you do too. We meet a lot of teenagers doing this and like some of them, you kind of want to just hold up a mirror so they like appreciate how cool they are. So they'll be like, yeah. yeah, I'm so, I don't fit in. I'm such a freak. Everyone is cooler, more interesting than me. And you talk to them for like five minutes and they list all of their interests. They list all the things they're doing, all their fan fiction, all their hobbies. And you're like, holy yeah. shit, you're cool. Holy crap, you're such a cool person. <laughs> like, it, it, it's like, I I mean, maybe I'm I'm being like unkind to my own past self when I'm <laughs> making this comparison. Maybe, no, 16 year old, I'll stand by that. But I'm like, I was like, no, 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 no. You have like so much going for you and if we were just able to, I don't know, see ourselves. I think we assume when we're young that we can see ourselves how other people see us, but that's us picking and choosing the bad. Whereas like, there are so many mm -hmm. people out there that think you're so freaking cool. Like there are so many like cool personality traits that in like quirks that people, young people have. And Corinne is that like, yeah, she said, oh, everyone hates me because I'm always talking and I say what I think and I'm a social and I don't have a lot of friends. But I, I, I think I wrote it a little bit from the perspective of like, no, that's so cool. It is so fun to have that person in your life who'll just like be like, yeah, they won because they were better. Do better next time. You still did great. <laughs> this was really fun to write. Yeah, I just, um, and I, I also want to give a shout out to um, Ming, who I adored. I just thought he was like the absolute cutest. And one of the things that I wanted to, to mention too, and I'm so curious to know if this is intentional. Um, there's a moment with Ming that I'm not going to say more about for, because of spoilers, but then there's also a moment with Henry's dad. Um, both are come near each other kind of toward the end of the story. And um, I noticed that like one of the things that you did that was so charming about this book <laughs> like, is you you have taken these beats that um we associate with rom-coms and you have played around with some of them with characters who are not the couple um how intentional was that very intentional Partly because you phrased it as a <laughs> compliment, but I'm I'm really glad. <laughs> it's, it's, 
Yeah, it's it, it's something you can't quite talk about because it happens near the end of the book. But I do think like two big emotional moments for Henry happen with his dad and with Ming, his best friend that he sort of keeps at a distance. And, you know, if it was strictly a rom-com, all those moments would only exist with Corinne. But romance, and I'm a big proponent of that, shouldn't consume us. It should be something that adds to us. It shouldn't be the fire under the soup. I'm making soup right now. Um, <laughs> that, like burns it all to the <laughs> But it should be like... I just assumed it was like a Canadian expression. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, most of my weird expressions are like stuff that falls under my line of sight right away. <laughs> but the romance should be additive. It should be like all the cool flavor you pour into the pot. So their romance isn't really all that burning. But I do think two big moments for Henry are the, you know, loaded conversations he has with his best friend where they just they break that last barrier of intimacy and i i love friendships i think i'm like i would say i'm an eight out of ten at, eh, i'm being kind i would say i'm a six out of ten at relationships i get how they work i get a passing grade and i'm able to sort of like meet the requirements of the syllabus um i'm like a two out of ten at friendships i think my friendships are super volatile <laughs> Um, and they're either, like really successful and incurred in, man. We're never getting rid of each other. It's just forget it. We are going to be at each other's funerals one day. Or they're very sort of like, sort of like, yeah, I text them all the time. And then we don't hear from each other for like two years. So I think friendship is something that gets underplayed a little bit. And Ming is a very, very important character to Henry. And even Henry might not say it. He might not realize it. But the fact that he hasn't been able to share this last layer of himself with his best friend was one of the emotional holdbacks that made his relationship with Corinne less open. And his dad is a really big hurdle. That's like, he needs to have the big conversation at the end. I was like, I'm sorry I fucked up. Um, and it's with dad because our families also shape us a lot. And yeah, I love me. I, I, I really do. Like they're, there's a scene earlier, like around the middle of the book, that's just the three of them in a pool type situation. And I, I, I have to cut like a thousand words from it because I just like, well, they can't just be talking this entire time, but I love spending time with those three together. <laughs> oh. oh my gosh. Yeah. I could like picture doing that in real life. Yeah. <laughs> Create characters. Like that's my advice for anyone writing. Because people <laughs> ask you for advice on writing and I'm like, there's a full draft of this book that's very bad that the publisher did not like. <laughs> um, but my thing is always like, write characters you want to spend time with. Like, that's always the best, easiest way to go about it. Wow. Oh my gosh. I love that. So here I'm jumping back in. Whoops. I think I am. There I am. Hi. Hello. Oh my gosh. I loved, <laughs> I loved the scene with, with Henry and his dad. I was like, I got all teared up. Cool. Thank you. Which is really so good. Yeah. Love that. You, you yeah. amazing, Ben. I'm so happy we are so, this has been so much fun to hear you guys um, talk about it. So it's Charming as Verb. It's on sale tomorrow. Yeah. You can get it at the bookstore. Um, and thank you so much. Congratulations, Ben. Thank you so much, Becky. Becky, and thank you so, so much for doing this, really. Like, like, those were the funnest. I'm still gonna send you an email after this saying like thank you for doing this, but like those were such fun and insightful questions, and I love talking about this stuff with you. Yes, it was, oh, it was amazing. Send me, send me that email. I'm just getting started. That's just the kind of relatively non-spoiler version of my <laughs> gushing. There's more, so to be continued. <laughs> so, awesome. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Becky. All right, bye. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>